And that was the first professional opinion that we had had to confirm that Mel had eye problems. Mel here and welcome back to Mel's Blind Life, the YouTube channel all about blindness. As you can see today, I have a special guest. My mommy's back here with us. Good Hi, morning, mommy. everyone. Hello. How are you, mommy? Oh, hot and bothered, but I'm fine, thank you. I've mm. just had my long train and bus trip, so I'm just starting to settle down into quiet Mildura mode. Mm. So as you can see by the title for this one, we're talking about something that um, has been, I guess, pretty important in my life and in my mum's life too. And we're talking about my diagnosis with rod cone dystrophy and what it was like going through that for my mum. So mom. for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with my story, I am nearly 25. Um, I have rod cone dystrophy and I am now completely blind with very little light perception. And the rod cone dystrophy is genetic in my family. Um, my mum has it, my auntie Marg has it, and my nana, who is sadly no longer with us, also had rod cone dystrophy. So mum, you grew up um, with blindness all around you. Um, your husband, my dad, is blind. Mm -hmm. when when was it that you thought um, that you may end up with a child with blindness or low vision well actually we knew right from before you even conceived that we had a 50 50 chance of you inheriting my condition mm -hmm. and we also knew there was a chance that you would inherit Jeff's condition as well so, because Jeff has actually uh, two nieces who have varying degrees of his uh, eye condition too. So are there either one of those two conditions, is there any way that I could have had some kind of surgery or treatment after birth to regain my eyesight? Not with the rod cone dystrophy. So <clears throat> it is a degenerative condition and there was nothing that can be done for that condition. If you had have inherited your father's condition instead, then you would probably have had uh, cornea grafts at quite a young age, probably somewhere around five to eight years old, and you would probably be driving a car now instead of driving a guide dog. However, life doesn't always turn out um, in a positive way from a vision point of view, but it's turned out in a positive way for a lot of other points of view. So when I was conceived and I was born, what, what happened? When did you know? What were the signs? Um, did you have any tests during your pregnancy to find out if I was? All right. So, Firstly, I was offered um, amniocentesis. So basically that's a, a test that um, takes the amniotic fluid and tests for genetic defects. The problem with that was 26 years ago when they were looking at doing it for you, that uh, they'd have some risk in that it was known to cause miscarriages. So when the doctor offered that to me, and I said to him, well, I don't intend terminating the pregnancy anyway, so I might as well just wait and see what happens and take away that risk of anything happening uh, before you were born. After you were born, 
I had a few people say to me that you used to look into the light a lot and hold your hands in front of your eyes a lot. When you were about 10 weeks old, Jeff actually had an appointment with his eye specialist. We decided to take you along and get him to have a look at you just on a casual basis and see what he thought. And he said to us that he saw some sign of strabismus or a squint, if you like, in one of your eyes. We took you back to him again about four to six weeks later and his comment this time was that he could see something um, which was in the opposite eye from what he had said last time. And at that point, and that was the first professional opinion that we had had to confirm that Mel had eye problems. After we had heard his analysis, he suggested that we take Mel to a children's specialist. So we went to him and he was a specialist in things to do with the retina for children. He did some retinal scans and confirmed that you had the retinal condition that I had. And we just continued to see him up until you were 16. So was there anything that the doctors could do um, to save my eyesight? Obviously, I couldn't have it brought back, but was there anything that they could do to surgically repair my eyes in any way that I could get some good useful vision or? No, there was actually no rectification for the uh, retinal dystrophy. However, you did have a squint and that can impact on depth perception. When you were around about just over two, I think it was, we had the squint corrected. That was only a surgery of about an hour. But after that, there was really no intervention except to just keep a check on how much vision you had and to just make sure that things weren't deteriorating. Of course, when you went through puberty was when the major deterioration started, which is common with this kind of condition. And as you said earlier, you're now at the position, now that you're nearly 26, that uh, all your vision has basically gone except for a little bit of sight, uh, light perception. So was there anything special that you and dad did as my parents? Um, any special training or anything that a sighted child probably wouldn't do? And if there was, what was it and how old was I when I started it? Well, the first thing <coughs> that I did was I got the early childhood intervention team from what is now Vision Australia, was back then RVIB. I had them come and start working with you when you were only about five months old, so around about June, July, after you were born. And we did a lot of things about how to stimulate you, uh, what we made special big toys that you could see, colourful things that you could play with, things that made sounds. I bought a lot of toys that were vocal toys, which were really good because it was good for me because I could then interact with the toys as well. But it was also really good for you because you could uh, hear what the instructions were on the toy and then uh, follow this, those instructions. So we did a lot of that. We also enrolled you in creche very early. You were first started creche when you were only about two. And the reason for that was because dad and I were both blind, we wanted to make sure that 
you got used to interacting with sighted people, not only sighted adults, but children of your own age as well. So you went to creche a couple of times a week, right from when you were only about, uh, as I said, two years old. And then together with the creche and the intervention from Vision Australia, we just worked through all the different issues that you had. One of the issues was about getting you up and walking because you had nothing to look at that you wanted to go for. You were a lot slower to walk than other children. I used to actually use cloth nappies with you because I didn't believe in <laughs> disposables until I discovered that the disposables were much thinner and actually gave you a little bit more movement and they actually encouraged you to move a little bit more. You never crawled, you used to scoot along on your backside instead of crawling. And when we were trying to get you walking, I was actually told not to use a walker, but I knew from experience with my younger sister, Marg, that the walker actually gave her a lot of confidence to get up and about. And so I did actually buy a walker and I used that for a little while until you tipped yourself out of it, which was when I realized that you were ready to walk without it. So uh, that was really all we did and probably not a lot different from what sighted parents do with their children. It's just that we did the things in a slightly different way because we couldn't see and you couldn't see. But we didn't didn't change anything. We still let you go out and play in the mud and we still encouraged you to be as active as possible, playing on swings and riding bikes and um, all those sorts of things. So we still encouraged you to help us in the garden and to ride in the wheelbarrow and to help us collect wood and all those sorts of things. So we never tried to stop you from doing anything. We always tried to encourage you to do as many things as possible. And the other thing we did was we enrolled you in as many programs as possible that allowed you to get experiences that we couldn't give you. Programs like uh, guide dog camps, programs like the local um, disability support program that took you to events once a month. So we made sure that the things that we couldn't do with you, we made sure that you got those things into your life in a, a different way. Was there any one thing that you can think of off the top of your head that was kind of challenging about having a blind child? I mean, obviously being a parent is challenging, but was there one thing that sort of stuck out to you that was challenging either from a parental level or from, you know, specifically because of my blindness? Mm, the challenge was not so much from your blindness as from ours. Not being able to jump in the car and drive you to this and take you to that. And I remember you really desperately wanted to learn to ride horses, but for us to take you horse riding and we did it a few times but we had to either walk or get a cab for three k's to our station catch the train three three or four stops and then get off the train and get another cab for about 20 minutes to the place where we were taking you riding we did try to get you involved in riding for the disabled but unfortunately again the only RDA that was near us that wasn't a school day was over in Dalesford so we couldn't get you there so it was not so much what was difficult because you were blind but it was things that for me the most frustration was that we were blind and not able to give you all the experiences that we wanted to give you. Now, one of the things that uh, some people have said is, when did you realise that you were going blind? Like, when did I realise that I was going to be going blind and things like that? 
I don't remember actually sitting down and having a talk about, you know, this is what's wrong with you and this is what's going to happen. A bit like the the talk that <laughs> young teenagers get. <clears throat> I don't remember ever having anything like that. So how how did I find out that I was low vision and going to go blind and that not everyone was like like us? I think it was weird weird to say but i think it was more by osmosis <laughs> because because we were blind you knew you were the same as us and you knew that we were different from sighted people and i guess it just evolved that way we did tell you i i don't remember exactly when but we did when you were in about grade one or two, we started teaching you Braille. And I do remember saying to you at the time that it was important for you to learn Braille because you would probably lose your sight later on in life. There was quite a bit of resistance to learning Braille. However, you did uh, take it up and you did learn it. And again, around about grade two, three, we started to introduce talking computers. And again, I remember saying to you, this is because, you know, you will get to a stage where you won't be able to use the computer uh, without having speech. But basically it was just how it was. You understood that we were different from other people just because dad and I were already different and because you could tell when family members came they weren't the same as mum and dad they could see things and you know your family members would say to you you know you've got a dirty shirt on or you've you know get the dirt off your face or whatever so you sort of picked up from that that oh mum didn't tell me my shirt was dirty mum didn't tell me I got dirt on my face so you sort of picked it up from that that kind of thing I guess and and as I said you know we introduced talking computers and braille and stuff very early to try and have you prepared for when your vision did eventually go. So knowing now that, you know, I'm 25, um, nearly 26, that I have absolutely no vision apart from the tiniest bit of light perception, how does that make you feel knowing that when I was, you know, when I was a young child, I could see a little bit and now I can't see anything at all. Oh, I mean, obviously, it's it would be good if you could, but we knew right from the start that when it was my condition you were diagnosed with, that this was what was going to happen. We tried our best to prepare you for that, and I still expect no more or less than I expected beforehand that you will achieve in your life what it is that you want to achieve you probably haven't found it yet but you will and there's no barriers to you achieving whatever you want to do in your life and I I would like myself sometimes really love to have back the tiny little bit of vision that I had but that's the it's not going to happen and what you've got now the skills that you've learned have prepared you for having no vision and i expect that you will go ahead with your life and achieve anything and everything you want to achieve and probably more so is there one piece of advice or anything that you would like to give to maybe a person you know who is my age who is blind or has low vision who is looking at becoming a parent or um, and maybe is concerned that the vision condition that they have would, you know, carry on. Is there anything that, you know, you want to give to someone like me advice about, you know, moving forward with blindness or being a blind parent? Well, in terms of being a blind parent, if you are comfortable with your vision, and you are prepared to accept 
that your child may have that vision and you're prepared to teach the child all the skills you have, then I don't see any reason to not go ahead. If you're uncomfortable with your vision and if you're uncomfortable having a child with low vision, then I suggest that you, you know, maybe think about it until you are comfortable because unless you're comfortable with your vision and you're comfortable with teaching your child how to live with low vision, then they're really, it's, it's not gonna work for you because the main thing about having a child is that you're comfortable and happy with the child and that you're not um, constantly stressing. Remember, there's lots of services out there to help you. There's, um, particularly now under NDIS, there's a lot of services available to you and your child that weren't available for me. And, you know, you, there is solutions that weren't available to me. But I just say that the main thing is that you have to be comfortable in your decision that the child you have may have vision impairment and that you have to be prepared to teach that child to live the fulfilled and comfortable and happy life that you're living. And is there anything that um, that because of the fact that I am have blindness and anything like that that you know I have sort of done that as a parent you weren't sure whether I would do or you know is there any kind of milestone or something that or activity or something that sticks out in your mind that I did and you were like yeah my daughter did that even though she's blind oh I've I've never had any doubt that you were able to do anything that you want to do. My my big um, positive was when you took yourself off to Perth for a week, travelled over on the train and stayed at a motel in a completely strange environment and brought yourself back on an aeroplane. That was that was pretty groovy and and to me that said you had grown up you were happy in your skin and that that was the the thing that said to me you're you're out there you're ready to challenge the world and you're ready to achieve whatever it is that you want to achieve cool well thank you mummy for coming no to problem. the video no problem and um parting your wisdom <laughs> or departing <laughs> Um, so thank you all for watching. Um, I didn't know how this one would turn out actually. Um, but thank you all for watching. Please remember to leave a comment down below if there is anything that you would like to ask either mum or I. So please remember to share this video with your friends and family, give it a, a like, and we'll hopefully be back and talking again soon. Mm. And a side note, I hit 201 subscribers on Sunday, Australian Eastern Standard Time. I was very excited when I woke up and saw in my stats 201. So please remember to subscribe to Mel's Blind Life to get some more awesome blindness content from a single, completely blind Australian woman with very little light perception and my guide dog and the occasional visit from my mummy. So thank you all very much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.